Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode number 247 of the SoxProspects.com podcast. We are the web's number one source for information on the Boston Red Sox from top to bottom, from Fort Myers to Worcester, across the Pike to Fenway, and all stops in between. Thank you all for listening. My name is Chris Hatfield. I am the executive editor of Sox Prospects, and I am joined, as always, by our director of scouting, the birthday boy, Ian Cundell. What's up, big man? What, what did you do? For what, what did you turn 22 three um age is just the number so i don't <laughs> we don't talk about those I, things I, I, i'm not as old I, as you that's all that yeah, matters exactly um <laughs> no i did absolutely nothing and it was fantastic that a boy you've learned you've you've leveled up you've mm-hmm. learned the doing nothing is the best thing to do for your birthday I made a nice pasta sauce to go on my uh pasta Ooh. Ooh, that's what, what i did that what night kind Meat sauce, ragu? Uh, no, I uh, just a lo- lot of lot of alliums, um, some greens. Uh, alliums? Yeah, like onions. Al- is that a word? Alliums? Yeah. Have you never heard that word before? No. Is this cultured? like a British thing? No. Are you I've not, never heard that. Not cultured? I guess so. It's like Damn. onions and garlic. It's actually. Alliums. All right. I'm big on alliums. So there you it's go. It's onions, garlic, scallions, shallots, leeks, and chives. All things I like. Okay, cool. Hey, all things I really like too. Welcome but, um, to the Sox Prospects Vocabulary Podcast. That's yeah, no, it was, of the day. It, was, uh, it was fun. Got some cooking in. <laughs> that a boy. Nice. All right. Well, anyways, happy birthday, my friend. Uh, and welcome to all of you to the show. Thank you for the download, the stream, or however it is that you're listening to the show. We appreciate it. On a side note, there's definitely a horticulturist who's listening to the to the show and is going to email in and be like, that's just not the right way to use that <laughs> word. But if you are that person, just let me have my moment. Love because it. I just stumped Chris. There is actually a discussion on our forums that like comes back from time to time about like growing tomatoes. It like randomly like goes away and comes back. It's I don't understand it, but it's pretty great. Interesting. Like talking about weird heirloom tomatoes. Uh, but at any rate, I do enjoy an heirloom tomato. So yeah. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we're not here to talk about horticulture. We're here to talk about the Boston Red Sox and the Boston Red Sox farm system. There's plenty that's happened over the past week. We've got uh Jaron Duran got called up and then sent down the next day. And we have uh, some signings. We're going to check levels today as well. And of course, as always, your emails. But first, we want to note, if you want to support the show, you can do that a couple of ways. First, spread the word. Tell your friends. Put it out there on Twitter. Um, tell I mentioned your aunt last time. Maybe your uncle. Give them a heads up about the show. Uh, spread the word. You can also rate and review us on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, uh, uh whatever other pod catcher it is that you listen on Spotify. That's the word I was listen, looking for. Whatever is you listen, rate, review, uh, give us a thumbs up, give us a review. We appreciate it. And of course you can support us on patreon.com slash socks prospects, pledge a certain amount per episode and get some neat perks to go along with it. We appreciate all of our Patreon supporters and we shout out our $5 level Patreon supporters at the end of the show in the credits as always. Um, and of course, we're going to get your emails today. Send your emails to podcast at SoxProspects.com because we want to talk about what you all want to hear about, but you all want to hear us talking about things that aren't the introduction. So let's jump right into it, Ian. Uh, last week, while I was at a work conference, I got noticed one morning that, oh my goodness, Jaron Duran is on his way to Boston. We were all excited about, hey, is this, are they going to you know bring him up to try and give him some run in the outfield, kickstart this offense? Well, it turned out that Duran was a replacement for Kike Hernandez, who went on the COVID IL for a single game, which I just, I always think it's weird when a guy gets called up for one game, leads off and gets sent right back down. That's always a little strange, but I I guess I get why. Um, And we could get more into that. The full transactions were that Rich Hill and Kike Hernandez went on the COVID IL and the Red Sox called up Duran and John Schreiber as COVID replacement players, uh, Duran went back down the next day when Hernandez was activated and actually Schreiber has stayed up, um, since Hill is still on the COVID related injured list. And I guess we should also mention a couple days later, leverage innings in three, the last yeah. like four games or something. He's like immediately their third best reliever or something. It's, I mean, he's also throwing 94 from like a really arm. nasty arm slot. So yeah. Um, well, he's interesting now because he was not throwing 94 yeah. when I saw him last year. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Well, that's a race thing too. I mean, like they love, it's like Sal Garza got claimed by them. <laughs> Ralph, but yes. Ralph, whatever, same thing, but like they have one guy from each arm slot in the bullpen just to give you, to give you a look. Right. And he's a look guy. 
and and that's how he fits. And then meanwhile, of course, the other guy, Tyler J- Tyler Danish, came up on the fifth when Michael Walker went on the fifteen day injured lift with, list with left intercostal irritation. Which yeah, that was a, to that a, was a tough break because Walker's been pitching really well. Yeah, and it led to a last minute start for Tanner Houck, who went two and two thirds and didn't look all that great, frankly. Um, but of course, he found out potential closer Tanner Houck. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, that's for me. You know, everyone who's clamoring for like put Whitlock back in the bullpen and start Hauk. Well, it's like, if you like Hauk that much, why not try Hauk in the closer role? Like I, I'd, I'd be willing to look at it. I don't know. Let's see what he looks like in a true relief role first, but yeah, I mean, I think for me, Whitlock has more upside as a starter than Hauk does. And I don't think it's that close. Yeah. We've been saying that for um, a while. So yeah. I mean, if, if they, if they're going to go that route, I would just like to see them commit to one way or the other. That's the only thing I just, I don't like the yo-yo act they're doing. And I think it kind of has like a follow on effect and repercussions on the rest of the bullpen. Cause people don't really know their roles. And like, it's just the bullpen usage has been weird this year. And I understand it's part, partly by necessity, but I do think they're just clamoring. They're just clearly an arm or two short back there. Is this feels a lot like a team that needs to make a deal for a back end guy that just they need they need one more piece to push everyone down one yeah but i feel like that's just not it's not gonna happen it, they would do like that's no, just not, not in the rays mo or like you know the you know that 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 front office trees mo like is look, it i mean i feel like the dodgers would well but the dodgers are unique case because they have infinite monies and and, and an infinite farm system like they can literally trade like their 30th best guy and he becomes the 10th best guy in whatever team he's traded mm-hmm. to so mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean the Dodgers, I guess they did do it with Kit, Craig Kimball coming into this year, but yeah, that's like, that's exactly it. Yeah. It's just, they do, they do need someone back there because it's just, it, it it's pushed people around like Matt Strom, who's probably their best reliever with Whitlock starting mm-hmm. is having to be pitched wherever. Cause he's basically their fireman. He's fireman. He's the only guy core clearly trusts. And the knock-on effect of that is you have like Jake Diekman or Brazier pitching, you know, setup innings or Matt Barnes pitch, pitching setup innings. And it's just a, kind of a mess, especially with when they don't clearly don't trust Barnes. They don't trust Sal Moore. They don't really seem to tr- trust Cutter Crawford, who's just not pitching at all right now. Like they're just carrying so much dead weight almost in the bullpen that I, th- I think something has to give at some point soon. And that's why I kind of wonder if we're going to see them like start – dipping into the triple a 40 man guys and maybe give a start or two to someone from down there in order to kind of like free some stuff up to move guys to the bullpen and see what they have there. Well, the thing is right now, if you include how they have four active starting pitchers, if you don't, then they have three, right? I mean, that's a problem now, right now they're able to get around it because they have all kinds of off days. They had one on Monday. They have one tomorrow on Thursday. We're recording this the night of Wednesday, the 11th after the Red Sox just lost in walk-off fashion. Um, and their next off day is on the 23rd, which is when the 23rd is uh, a week from Monday. So they have 10 to now. Yeah. They have 10 games in a row without an off day. So they're going to need a fourth and a fifth starter during that time. Um, who that's going to be, who knows? We know that, uh, Nick Pavetta is going to throw to throw on Friday. We know that Garrett Whitlock is going to throw on Monday. We don't know who's throwing this weekend. Um, we do know that possibilities to do that are Connor Siebold and Josh Winkowski because Whitlock, uh, Siebold, I was going to say Whitlock, Siebold was capped at about 62 pitches in his start last night. He went like three innings ish. Um, it wasn't a great outing. It was probably his worst start of the year, but it was definitely his worst. It was like five runs on three innings. It was definitely his worst. Um, and then meanwhile, today, um, Winkowski was pulled after 40 or 30 something, 34 pitches, I think over two innings in which he was cruising. We heard at first that it was workload management, which I, yeah, I told you at first, I was very skeptical of that. I mean, I, I, yeah, I didn't, I disagreed with that, but <laughs> you I thought, I thought it made sense. Like it was kind of well, what I, I then talked myself into it because it did. Cause it's like, Oh, maybe this is what they're yeah. doing instead of skipping starts because as well, as well, I guess we could just mention it now. Chi Jung Lu in Greenville, whose workload they're clearly worried about right now because they pushed him Understandably. back a day. Yeah, they pushed him back I mean, he's not, he's very small. Like he's yeah. like six foot, like 170. So, and yeah. he's losing velocity later in outings. So yeah. they pushed his start back a day and held him to two innings for a week. Um, and he's on a very strict pitch count. We thought, oh, maybe this is what they're doing instead of skipping starts now. 
Um, that said, I probably should have stuck to my guns because then it, I think actually Chad Tracy like kind of let slip that the team might need guys. And then we come to find out that this weekend they're hoping to get Rich Hill back. They may run a bullpen game and Winkowski and Seabold are probably options as well, depending on what they need. So Seabold, because they limited his pitch count, probably is available Saturday, but Sunday would be normal rest. Um, Winkowski, Monday would be normal rest, but because he threw so little today, you would think he could probably come up and throw. He could probably give you three innings on Saturday, four on Sunday, maybe five, depending on how quickly they go. So those guys are both kind of in the offing, so to say. And I guess we might just, it just logically seems to flow into the thing we were going to talk about for Worcester on check-in levels. Just the idea that you had raised in a recent episode, Ian, that the Red Sox had a lot of dead weights, not the word, but 40 man roster spots being used on players who could not help the major league team right now. It seems that in like, like a, what was it? Two, three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Yeah. In that span, that seems to have changed dramatically. Eh. Yeah. Not, I mean, but maybe yes not dramatically. No. Not, but... I don't think dramatically is the right word. It's changed. I just, sure. I don't, I don't sure. think it's, there's still like some guys who have no shot of coming up to the big leagues, sure. obviously, and who are there for more like development, especially purposes. right now, especially right now. Um, but I think that there is, they are getting like some of the guys also that we are concerned about are turning into potential like legitimate depth, which is obviously a very good thing too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and the names I have in mind when I say that are obviously Seabold and Winkowski, who we are seeing treated like depth right now mm-hmm. in a good way. Yeah. Um, Jaron Duran used as a guy who can come up and help them whenever they need it, which is not terribly surprising. He's hitting well and he was up last year. Jeter Downs looks like a guy who could come up tomorrow if they needed him for me right now. I mean, I think he would get destroyed by pitching still, um, but I think he could feel the position well enough. Sure. Sure. And what would you, I mean, as, as far as what you've seen and heard from him at short, I mean, it seems like he has even taken a step beyond what we had him. Yeah, no, he, he, he's good at short. He's, I, it's like a, it's like potentially a 55 now. Um, whereas I was more like in the 45 to 50 range last year. Yep. Um, he's just, he's remained, he's remained athletic range is good. Hands work. It's good arm. Uh, he's, he's definitely, I think opened some eyes there. And I, I know the triple eight, I think it's coaching staff has talked about how impressed they've been with him there. Yep. I also do think it helps having Tristan cost the first base because it's an absolute massive target. And he mm-hmm. makes a lot of bad throws look not bad because he can stretch a really long way and his hands are, he's, he's good at first base too. So I think that helps, but, um, yeah, no, I, I, I think what downs is doing is good. I, I, I was, I was comparing some video of like him, you know, pre and post and, it's pretty subtle changes. It's it's this mostly at the plate, just to be clear. correct. Yep. Um, because if you look since April 20th, he's 241, 397, 574. So OBP and slug are really good. His bad is 242, which is you know low. But if, if you think about it in the context of how no one in baseball is hitting right now, that's actually a really good line. Um right. And I think the most encouraging thing for me is 16 strikeouts and 68 plate appearances. So, you know, that's Let's do some quick math. Uh, it's like a 24% K rate, which is fine. You know, if he's under 25%, I think that's kind of the target for him because he's definitely always going to have swing and miss, especially in zone. But if he can keep it manageable, that's very important. And the power is showing up again, which is encouraging. But it was interesting comparing his swing. I took some video of his swing and sent it around to a few people to, to, to look at and kind of give me some feedback. And he's definitely shorter and more direct to the ball, which was obviously an issue before was he's pretty long. He was getting eaten up by fastballs up. But Overall, it's actually, it's pretty subtle changes. Um, it's more like swing path and kind of like, it seems like a lot of pitch decision changes, you know, swing, swing decisions, excuse me. Um, but yeah, I mean, him, you know, showing that he can be a legit depth option is very important. And I, I think it could make them feel comfortable, like moving off of Jonathan Aruse potentially and opening up a 40 man spot there, which they might need for someone like John Schreiber, if they want to keep him up or um, well, something like that. It's interesting because Aruse isn't even, doesn't even count on the 40 right now because he's still on the COVID IL. No, but he will eventually. Yeah, but I'm just saying, but the thing, yeah, but the thing is they're at 40. So even if they DFA him instead of activating, I don't think they're, they're are, they, are we sure they're at 40? Because that's counting a, Schreiber. Yeah. So which it shouldn't, right? Well, if they, when they, if they send Hill with Schreiber down, then Hill's coming back on and that's a net. Yeah, zero. but he's technically not on the 40 man. 
under MLB uh, rules. He's not the, on the it. way they announced the transactions. So they've announced transactions as added blank to the roster. And that has te- typically meant that they did not count. Right. So Schreiber, I mean, they yeah. called selected his contract. Oh, well, then that means time. he was added to the 40 man. But yeah. So that's what I'm saying. But it's like, that is also that a also COVID replacement, but that also sure. that also could have been a loss of translation thing. We've seen it that easily before. could have. So uh, who knows is my is my point. Um, I've got him on there because even with him, they're at forty. But like, if they claim a guy tomorrow, then obviously we know he doesn't count. Um, but on downs, one thing that I, I tweeted today, Ian, is the the progression that he is showing at the plate over the course of the year. In the first two series, in eleven games, he struck out thirteen times in forty nine plate appearances. Um, his hitting for some power, but, uh, the, uh, 13 in 49 plate appearances is a 26.5% K rate. Okay. So to call it a 26% K rate in the, oh, sorry. Those are most more recent. I'm oh, sorry. Here's what I meant to say in his first two series, it was 21 and 47 plate appearances. So that's a 44.6% K rate. Unacceptable. 44.7, actually. Sorry. Um, hitting 233, 298 on base. Looked terrible. Since then, he has struck out 18 times in 72 plate appearances. This is entering today, and that's a 25% K rate. Um, this didn't include today where he went 0 for 2 or 0 for 4 with 2 Ks, unfortunately. So that number's gone up a little bit. But he's cutting the strikeouts, increasing his walks. He went from having four walks in his first 10 games to 13 in his next 17. Um, none today, so make it 13 in his next 18. Uh, and meanwhile, like his average on balls in play has plummeted. So just he's, he's having bad luck, which is why his average is staying the same despite his on base going up and his slugging going up. So he is showing progression, which is important. Um, again, he needs to keep it up. He's done this to us twice before, last fall in the Arizona Fall League and shortly before that in the last kind of finishing kick during the regular season. We'll see if he can consolidate those gains, but I'm encouraged by what I'm seeing right from down. So good to see him getting back on the radar. Um, so there's, there's more depth showing up there, but to me, Ian, the question, I think you said that you had some thoughts on this is how they use this depth in the majors. Um, what they do to, to use this, to improve a major league team that is struggling mightily right now. And you had said you had some thoughts, at least with regards to the bullpen. Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, the number one thing is I would keep Schreiber up whenever that decision needs to be made. He looks like one of their better relievers right now. His fastball velocity is up significantly. Um, as we said, it's kind of nasty arm slot. And I think, though, that the way to do it is if they bring – is if assuming that they're going to get Rich Hill back um, shortly – is I think it's time to give either Siebold or Rinkowski, probably Siebold, a look in the rotation and just push Hauk to the bullpen full time or even Whitlock also. Mm-hmm. And while I think Whitlock, you know, should be a starter long term, I do think wonder if the best, you know, course of action for this team for this season is him in the bullpen. Because if you have either Hauk, Whitlock, or both in the bullpen, I think it provides some stability at the end. It pushes guys into more natural roles. Like, you know, it pushes um, Diekman and uh, Hansel Robles in, into more setup role, not setup roles, like, you know, middle inning roles, which I think they're better suited for, frankly. Pushes Strom. He can be your lefty, you know, fireman, come in whenever you want. You have one of Hauk or Whitlock close, and you have the other one is like your true setup guy. That's like a, that's, a legit back of the bullpen compared to what they have now, but that only works if you know you have yourself healthy starters and the triple A depth guys. And now it looks like they might have some triple A depth guys. And I just think it's you know, for the way the team is currently constructed, it makes sense to just see what you have with Siebold, especially because if like Siebold or Winkowski, one or both, you try them and they don't work, then maybe you do have to go out and get another guy either for the pen or the rotation soon. But if one of them can work, then you know, that's an internal fix to the current problem. I mean, the problem is Cora has four relievers looking at it right now that he does not appear to trust. One of them is Matt Barnes, who apparently the stuff looked the stuff was better last time out, but he's clearly not back in the circle of trust yet. Um, Hirokazu Sawamura, who like I just don't know how he's still on the roster. It's well, it's weird. Like they go between stretches of not using Tim him to then between April 30th and May 4th, he pitched in four consecutive games. Well, because I think they just they don't like it. He, they'll, they don't really care about it. Like they'll just use him whenever. 
And then Cutter Crawford has pitched. That, that's once. that's that's poor phrasing. I, I don't mean they don't actually literally not care about him. It's just his usage is not being monitored as closely as some of the other pitchers. I think well, is a better way. To I say think it. it's being monitored, but it's because it's like you know the first outing he was the out game I was at where he like faced one batter because it was a bunt back to or bunt back to the mound and he threw it away. Yeah, and the the zombie runner came in. Um, the next day he only threw a third of an inning you know, off day on May 30 he throws an inning. And then on May 4th, he throws a third of an inning to, to get out of an inning. That Barnes he seems like he's kind of the guy that finishes up innings so that someone else can come in with a clean one, exactly. which every team does need. It's like the Miguel Suero of the MLB team. Yeah. But it's like, I mean, Cutter Crawford has pitched once, has pitched once since May 3rd and everyone else in the bullpen has thrown at least three times, except for Tyler Danish, who's only been up for three games and he's pitched twice. Yeah. Like they're not using him. So if you're not going to use Cutter Crawford, get sent him down yeah you know but that but that but that that is the thing though if you look at the current 40 man like if you're sending Crawford down unless you're calling up and I don't think they could call it Phillips Valdez yet he's still in that window where he has to stay down uh Valdez went down on the second yeah so he can come up now he He can can come up he could come up tomorrow Friday's game yeah tomorrow but uh, up until that point he wasn't an option Mm-hmm. And then the other uh, the other three pitchers on the forty man that are in AAA are, are Siebold, actually Winkowski and Hernandez. So like, is it fifteen days now? Yeah, it's either ten or fifteen. I think it, might, well, it used to be ten. I know they were going to increase it to fifteen. I just don't know if that's one of those rules that they put like right time so out. So either on. my point though is just that there's no one to replace Crawford unless you're bringing one of those starters up because it can't be Valdez and they're not going to call up Darwin's in because he can't throw strikes still. Well, that's what I'm saying. So it, it leaves Winkowski or Siebold now. And you put them in the rotation and bump Hauk to the right. No, no, I'm, ag- I'm agreeing with you. I'm just saying that right. that's why Crawford, I think has still been there is they weren't ready for that, for that move. And oh, there's sure. no other option. So sure. he's and I mean, there by you, default. You look at the 40. I mean, the thing is if Hill gets activated, they're going to have to DFA someone to keep Schreiber up. Um, I mean, I see several J- candidates. Jalen Davis sticks out. Um, with- who they just claimed. Yeah. I mean, uh, I wasn't even thinking of him actually. Yeah. I mean, he seems like the, the easy one. Oh, then there's also Josh Taylor to the 60 day as, as that's Matt Collins pointed out to me. So that that's is one move. That is one, but I, I wonder like, could Ronaldo Hernandez's spot be in jeopardy? I mean, he's been atrocious. Ronaldo Hernandez. He's been awful. But I wonder if he's a guy you do a yo on Ibar for Christian cost move with. Yeah, maybe. I, I mean, he's, he's, he's hitting 127, 127, 211 with 23 strikeouts and no walks in AAA this year. Yeah, that's not that's not good, right? No, it's so, very bad. Yeah, so, I mean, his spot is a problem. You know, what are you going to do with a ruse when you activate him? Yeah. Does he just gets straight DFA. I mean, there's going to be some movement over the next yeah. couple of weeks. There has to be. Like, there has I, to be. Yeah. They, they have to do something. I mean, the... the Anyway, yeah. Well, and they're also going to have to make the move. What it when do they at the end of the month, right? They have to go to four four hitters. So, oh right, right. That's yeah, another one. So that's going to be coming. Another, well, that's and, just a pitcher down and a hitter up. Who's probably right? But like it's who? It's probably Jalen Davis right now. I'd go Duran and give him some run personally. I mean, yeah. I if you're going to call up Duran, you, if you're going to play him every day, I would call up Duran. But if you're not, I would think it might be just Jalen Davis. That's like the easy yeah. one. I mean, that's the easy one, but for me, I, I call Duran up and make him the, the strong side of a platoon with Bradley starting in left field and, and move Verdugo to right. Yeah, but that doesn't work really because they're both lefties. Oh, gosh, that's right. Yeah, that's the problem. Is the, he doesn't, Duran ah. doesn't fit what the roster needs right now. That's why Jalen Davis makes Well, what sense. the roster needs is a better hitter than Jackie Bradley. That's yeah, but, how he fits. I mean, and Bradley's defense is elite, has been, like, outstanding. Yes. But, yeah, yes. that's it the issue. Elite, like, but it's, you take a major defensive hit with Duran, and he's the same side, same-sided same hitter as Bradley. So when does Bradley have, so like, what becomes the point of Bradley? A defensive replacement? Like, that's just, like, a weird role to have. It's just, a, it, it's it's an... It, it unbalances the team. It's just I a guess. weird situation. I guess. I guess that's a fair point. Uh, it, it's it's not a question with an easy internal answer. And I think at this point, Bloom needs to be exploring outside options. Um, that uh, th- 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 this ship needs to get righted and quick. Because I just I, mean, I, I, I don't want to punt on this. Like I still think at the end of the day, it comes down to the offense for me. Like I understand the the bullpen has blown a lot of leads, but the problem is that every game they play is a close game because the pitching is keeping them in game. Well, the starting pitching is keeping them in games. The the offense can't score. So every game is like a three to two game 
Whereas if they had a bet, if the offense was playing up to its potential, which let's be honest right now, there's three guys who are hitting above. Like I think their WRC plus is above hundred as three is three players. Oh, like, Oh, Oh. So Jay Jaffe literally wrote this in his review on fan graphs of the team. Not only are the only three with an WRC plus above hundred, I didn't I even see this, but they're yeah. the only three with a WRC plus above 65. Yeah. That's what I mean. Is like at the end of the day and, I think that, you know, you can criticize high and blooms moves this off season and the last couple of off seasons, but at the end of the day, the offense they put together on paper should be good. And for whatever reason, you know, two thirds of it is not hitting at all. And you should be able, the way the team is constructed. And, and the way I look at it is look at what the Yankees are doing. The Yankees have two glove first guys at the end of their lineup who add very little on offense. And Josh Donaldson's not hitting at all either. It doesn't matter because the rest of the lineup is mashing. The first five or six in the Red Sox lineup should be enough to carry two or three, you know, dead weight at the end of the lineup offensively. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the problem is Kike Hernandez is hitting under, you know, to, under 200. Verdugo has been horrific after a good start. Granted, there is some unluckiness there. Yeah, but, he, his, he, Dan and Jaffe pointed that out that he's been getting brutally unlucky and his, same, his like, expected metrics are the same as JD Martinez. Right. Like Trevor Story is maybe coming around. He's showing signs of life, but he's, you know, performing below average. Like Vasquez has been atrocious at the plate. Uh, we know the first base position is a disaster right now. Like, I don't know how you can blame him high and bloom in the front office for six of the nine hitters in the lineup just being well, well below what they're supposed to be. And I that's, think I think that, you know, you can criticize first base, not bringing in a partner to pair with Dahlbeck in hindsight, probably an oversight. And I think that's something that we even said in the offseason. We were concerned about that. Same thing with the right field position, but the rest of the lineup still should have given them enough production to be able to make up for that, in my opinion. And other teams are doing exactly that and are able to make up for it because those other guys, you know, those the, the key guys at the top of the lineup are. And the Red Sox just aren't lineups not producing up to their capability and it's impacting. It's having this really big carryover effect on the rest of the roster. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think you can criticize bloom in this way. And by the way, I should note that Trevor story has crept up to a 66 WRC plus um, and Franchi Cordero in limited action has a 91, but otherwise it's, well, Martinez he's just walking. He's like, no, it's the Cordero has yeah. been weird since he called up. He's like walked like eight times or something. And he's, yeah. He's not striking out. He's just walking. Like, yeah. I mean, I think it's this. It's like, look, I, I get not blaming him for story. I get not blaming him for Kike Hernandez because no one was saying get rid of Kike Hernandez. I don't think you blame for Verdugo either. Like, and the, also, okay. So those. So three, that's that's three of the. That's the three that's of the three, six. six. And yeah. so I agree with you that you can't blame him for six. I think you can blame him, though, for the fact that you could have predicted that Christian Vasquez wasn't going to hit. You could have predicted that Jackie Bradley wasn't going to hit. And you could have predicted that. Um, who's the ninth hitter? Christian the Arroyo. The first or, baseman. Oh, the the first baseman, right? Dahlbeck. Okay, and, and I think that, but, but, that was but, all predictable. But you see what I'm saying, though. That else to, but to you work. see what I'm saying that like the Yankees are making that work. Like, look at Josh Donaldson's sure. stats right now. I think he's hitting yeah, like they're 200. not good. I like, I'm a I am a Josh Donaldson fantasy owner, and he is on my bench. That's what I mean. He's he's not hitting well at all. And then their catching situation, they don't hit it, hit it at all. And Kinner Falefa is like fine. You know, he's like I think he's hitting like 250. Yeah, with no I'm power I'm up right now because they've got ju yeah judge is being ju judge Rizzo Rizzo LeMay you are raking Stanton actually Donaldson's up to a 114 WRC plus oh is he I guess he just walks a ton his he on walks base is probably ton. like 370 which is something Three, his on base is 342 it's just that offense is down throughout the league so slash lines look yeah wor look worse than they really are in this hitting environment Higishioka has been brutal um yeah, I mean Gallo isn't really hitting. All they're getting that well. nothing out of Gallo. Glaber's not doing that much. Like, but Kinder they're just Felipe able. Has been a little below. Yeah, it's just with like Judge Stan, like the, the Judge Stan Rizzo, like guys like that. The other thing is the Yankees also walk a ton, which is something the Red Sox have really struggled with. It's the same is, the problem they had last year is they just chase like crazy. Well, and and what, I, what I think is interesting is with this new ball, I don't think you can rely and play offense the same way you did in no. past years. Like. If you no. look, I think the Guardians are leading baseball in runs this year, and the Guardians have like the lowest strikeout rate in baseball. And they've, I think, three guys of the like the ten lowest K rates in baseball, like guys like Stephen Kwan and uh, I think Miles Straw. Like the way their offense is constructed doesn't look like it should work, but it is really working in the new baseball and I, the new baseball world with you know the humidors and the weird inconsistent baseballs. And I, yeah, I think that's something that the Red Sox are just going to have to adjust to. Is their hitters are going to have to learn like. You're gonna have to walk. Like pitchers aren't throwing that many strikes. You can't expand the zone on them, and taking a walk is fine. And you also can't rely on the home run, though. You need to make more contact. And I think that that's something that adjustment has been 
kind of more of an issue than it was expected. Moving on, Ian, you were up in Portland again recently, or I guess saw Portland again. Oh, no, it was in Portland. That's right. Um, it was in Portland. Yeah. In Portland. Saw them again recently. Uh, how many games? Two? Three? Uh, three. I knocked three. out the rest of them. So I've seen the their entire the seen the entire rotation at least once. I've seen a couple, one guy twice. And I've seen all the hitters now. Um, all right. Well, let's. Yeah. I, I like being positive. So let's start in the rotation. Um, I guess so. So you saw this time you saw Victor Santos, you saw Jay Groom, and you saw Chris Murphy. Yes. Correct. Okay. Um, let's start. The people want to hear about Jay Groom. So let's start there. I thought you wanted to go positive. Um, yeah. It, yeah. Jay Groom. It was not good. Um, I, I don't know what he is now. And I think the first thing that stands out is wasn't thrilled with how he looked physically. Um, he looks like he's put on some weight body was looking pretty soft and he, you know, he was like 89 to 92 with below average command. Um, I heard he was 92 to 94 earlier in the year. So that seems like it might be down. Which is I mean, I, I, the only other the report I got earlier in the year was about the same, like ninety to ninety two. Really? Yeah. Okay. Right. So, I, I I had not seen the ninety two to ninety four, or at least the people I've talked to haven't. Um, but I I, I think the the most concerning thing to me, and it, it's something that I that's kind of been weighing on him. And I mean, you can like, and I've been the lowest on him in our rankings for this reason is I don't think he has a pitch that can miss bats at the highest level anymore. And in this outing, he just he just was giving up a ton of contact. He had, I mean, he got three swinging strikes the entire outing. And I know the previous one he got thirteen or something or twenty, but um, or thirteen in the previous one. Right. But in three of his five starts this year, he has less than five swinging strikes. And like the contrast of that with like Walter Bale and Murphy, who have multiple pitches that can miss bats, that's the biggest thing that stands out. Like, you know, Groom's eighty nine to ninety two slider. It's like 86, 80, 70, barely threw it. It was not good. It was, you know, below average pitch. Curveball was his best pitch. It's the only pitch he could consistently throw for strikes. Um, but it's still it's not as good as it used to be. It's you not, know, it's not it's it's, it's it's like a 50-55 yeah. now instead of a 60-65. And that full grade is massive, especially when your fastball is playing at like a 45. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's just like it and, and I'll admit it was cold. Like this is, you know, we're still port, we're still Portland in it feels like February, even though it's May. But at some point, you know, the stuff is just it is what it is. And I, I'm kind of afraid we're reaching that point where it's not gonna come back anymore. And this is the pitcher he is. And yes, he's got four pitches now. You know, the change up, I, I put a 50 on it. So but you're talking about like a guy with a fringy fastball below average command f- profile an average secondary and above average secondary. That's like a up and down fifth starter, like an emergency starter. That's not, there's just like, I mean, we'll, I'll talk about Chris Murphy in a second. Like Chris Murphy's just got better stuff than him now. Well, let's just go right into Chris. And Murphy. I think that that's just my concern with him is that I, I don't know what's going to improve because this is kind of consistent with what I've heard from scouts who've seen him earlier this year. And it's also similar to what we saw at the end when I saw him last year too, is the stuff is just, it kind of is what it is now. And then you contrast that with someone like Murphy who uh, Murphy threw, you know, Murphy, I mean, it was a much better outing. You know, I think he got 10 strikeouts in six innings. Um, But, you know, Murphy gave up 11 swing. He had 11 swinging strikes, which obviously is also already a big improvement, but you look, you know, he had, um, he had the 10 strikeouts he and it was the most encouraging thing to me was you know he showed both the curveball and the changeup. he showed feel for both of them um he got strikeout he used both of them to effectively get strikeouts got i think uh three with the changeup, like three with the curveball and then four with the fastball and his stuff is just better you know he was still 90 to 93 in the fifth inning he was mostly 90 to 94 uh a curveball you know 73 to 76 good depth you know he could snap it off couple inconsistent ones, but still, you know, it's at least an average pitch. Maybe you know, it's at least a 50, 55 pitch change up. Same thing. You know, he, he was using it effectively against lefties showed good feel for it. Like he's, you know, it, it's not like a, a mass. It's not the same stuff as like the Walter Bayo tier, but you know, it's a bucket of fifties and 55s, which if you have good enough command can play as like a back end starter or as a swing man. Mm-hmm. And that's just, I think the difference there is, you know, the command profile might be similar and both are like probably below average right now, but just Murphy's stuff is just better. Uh, do you have the same concerns with Murphy 
against right-handers that you had previously? His changeup was actually pretty good against righties. He got um, one, two, three. He got like eight or nine swing and misses with his changeup against righties. So if if you know if that holds, then that's definitely you know a development. And if you look at his splits this year, he's actually been better against righties than he has against lefties. Yeah. And both his home runs he gave up this year have been to lefties. So I'm wondering if kind of the development of the changeup has has alleviated some of the or you know kind of like minimum um, made the concerns about you know right-handed hitters getting a good look at him less prevalent and something that is that it seems like he's taken some strides in that area, which is definitely um, encouraging. Address them, yeah, 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 and and he's someone that, as I said, that like. If it doesn't work as a starter, I could see him pitching like a multi-inning, like two to three inning mm-hmm. bullpen role. The Jalen Beeks just don't, role. Exactly. Or mm-hmm. like Jeffrey Springs, what the Rays are doing with him right, right now. Whereas I just, I'm not sure that's something Groom, Groom's arsenal fits with. Because as I said, like you're talking, there's a big difference between a guy with 350 or 55 pitches and a guy with, you know, a 45 fastball, a 50 and a 55. So, because it's hard, especially like you groom tries to pitch off his curveball, or at least, and it just, it's a, it's a, that's a tough, it's tough to pitch backwards like that. Mm-hmm. You have to be able to establish your fastball. And when you're at, you know, 88, 89 miles an hour, it's a lot harder to establish it. And now I guess let's close out the rotation with what you saw out of Victor Santos. Uh, yeah. So Santos started the last game I was there and I mean, it, it, he's fine. It, it, he, it, he might pitch in the big league someday, but it's not, there's not a lot of ceiling there. He's like. 91 to 93 slider, 84 to 85 change up 82 to 85 change up flashed average slider was below average to me. So he's kind of a, he's more of a two pitch guy. Um, command is good. That's, that's definitely his calling card, but yeah, I don't see much upside there. He's clearly like the fifth option or, you know, it, it's, he's not on that same tier. I don't think as the other guys in that rotation, even groom, I think it's kind of like, you know, he's a solid innings depth guy for the minors. Maybe he gets up and gets a cup of coffee. I don't see really much impact potential with him. We talked last time about the bullpen and uh, and how strong the bullpen was. Anyone new stand out to you? I know last time we talked about, I think, Wallace, uh, Franklin Herman, who is apparently is Herman. Um, and I forget who else. Wallace, uh, Herman, Shugart. and Shugart. Yep. Um, beyond those guys, anyone else stand out to you in the bullpen? Worth um, no, I mean, Wallace was very good again. He threw one of the best break, breaking balls I've seen this year, like 70 breaking ball. It, it was nasty. It was, I think it was like 3,100 RPMs or something like his, uh, his stuff is really good. And it, he's an example. His numbers are going to be crushed because he had one terrible outing, which he'll happen because his delivery is pretty bad. But, um, you know, you take that outing out and the stuff is just, it's nasty. You know, it's potential like 70 fastball, 70 curveball, but the command is like a 40 and the delivery is a 20. So it's there's going to be some inconsistencies there, but his stuff is still very impressive. Um, I'd say that like the the new guys that were interesting to me were um, AJ Politi. I saw he was like 93 to 95. Mm-hmm. Curveball is pretty good. Uh, I was like 80 to 82. I put like a 55 on it. Fastball is like average-ish. I don't think he has the same impact potential as some of the other guys, but I could see him getting up as like a kind of like an up and down middle relief type. Um, I actually like Chase Shugart more than him, though. Shugart was had a really good first inning. He and then he came out for the second. He wasn't as good, but his first inning, he was like ninety five to ninety seven, with a good curveball, like above above average curveball and a slider. You know, that was it was okay. It wasn't great. It was just it was usable to like steal a strike, right? And a decent little changeup. And the biggest thing to me, it was mostly fastball curveball though, and that combo showed more potential than I had seen from him before. Like in that first inning, it was, I, you know, potentially something I could go like 60, 60 on, whereas I'm, I haven't seen a, an above average or plus secondary from him in the past. So that was eye opening to me. And he's definitely someone I'm keeping an eye on who I think can kind of pitch his way into a, a, a middle relief role with someone, whether it be the Red Sox or another team in the future. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And then I guess on the offensive side, Anyone worth writing home about? Because that's a, that is a team that is struggling mightily. They're they're doing the whole, you know. Usually teams have a relatively set lineup. It, you know, from day to day it'll change. But this guy usually hits third. This guy usually hits first. This guy usually hits second. But they are moving guys all around. Christian Cost just got demoted from the number two slot to the number six slot. It's like you know they've they've got Hamilton one, Grandberg three, and then from there it's kind of chaos right now. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's it's a it's a rough offensive team. Um, I I think that Devlin Granberg's probably the best hitter actually. 
on that team. He's got the best approach and he's got, you know, the short swing makes decent contact. He looked pretty good. Um, similarly, like Nick Sogard is another like con it's a lot of contact oriented guys, or it's a ton of guys with swing and miss. It's kind of not, not a lot in between. Um, Hamilton, I really like his, he's fast. Uh, he's a great base runner. I was very impressed with the base running instincts. I just have some questions about his swing. He, he puts the ball in the air way too much for a guy with his like lack of raw power and his speed. And I, I understand you want to try and, you know, impact the baseball, but if you're a 70 runner, you can't be, you know, I think his infield fly ball or his fly ball rate is like over 60% or something or 52%. Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's way too high. Like, that's not good. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful he'll kind of just start trying to hit the ball more on the line or put the, put it more on the ground and be able to use the speed. Cause he's a really good base runner. He's very fast and defensively um, also a little concerned about him at second. Wasn't great. The arms below average footwork wasn't great. Do wonder if he's going to get tried in center field at some point, because he looked actually most comfortable tracking the ball over his shoulder on infield pop-ups. So I do okay. wonder if that's something they try at some point. Um, well, if I could jump in and interject too, it's just weird because they have had, they went into the year thin in the outfield. Will Dalton gets hurt. They've had Granberg in center every game. He's not bad in center either. He's, not like, bad. He, he's fine. Yeah. It, it's yeah. not, it's, he's not like a above average offender, but he's usable out there. Yeah. You reported back with that, but like Nick Sogard is starting to get looks in the outfield now to get well, his back I mean, line up. It's also because Sogard like is one of the guys who makes contact on that team, right? And he also though he's fine. He's good. He, he's passable defensively at like second, short, third, and the corner outfields now. And for him long term, that's probably his pathway to a big league role if he's going to get one. I'm not sure he's more. He's more like an up and down guy at best to me. Like that's the ceiling. Yeah. But if he's going to reach, if he's going to you know reach that ceiling, it's going to be because he can play like six positions and you know make enough contact. Yeah, that sounds right. I mean. Yeah, they, they, I mean, they're, they're playing Brandon Howlett out in right field again. Um, I thought that they had maybe stopped that experiment, but he's back out there. They just they, they have a, a bunch of infielders and no outfielders. Pedro Castellanos is getting a ton of time in the outfield still, too. So, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's it's not a great offense. Um, and I, I think like the top prospect, like the other the other big pro or like you know, prospect we have pretty Christian highly ranked Cost. is Christian Cost. Yeah, his glove looked fine. You know, he was, he was good at defense. I know he made three errors, I think, two days ago or something after yeah. when they went to Hartford, but glove looked good to me. He had a home run, he's got some pop, but. His swing decisions and approach are just the concern for me. I actually like his swing more than some of the other guys who are putting up better numbers, but it's just, he's got a, it's really rough approach chases a lot of uh, secondary pitches out of the zone. You know, he'll let like a good pitch to hit go by and then chase a breaking ball that's in the dirt or, you know, a slider away. And he, I don't, I don't think he had walked until this past week um, all season. And so I just, you know, even if the defense is good, he's going to have to make some significant improvements with his approach in order to uh, reach his potential. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's time, but it's definitely something with him that um, that I'm going to be monitoring is kind of where the approach goes, because that's the big question I have with him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but just really quick, getting back to the Hamilton point. My point is, like, you're trying everybody else in the outfield. Why not give him a shot? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, though, that have they played Cannon at all at second base? Because I think I was thinking he's you know, playing he almost exclusively third, right? So if they move Hamilton, he might have played a little bit. I guess Sogard base. could play second base, but Sogard's yeah, also Sogard's, playing in the outfield. So well, Sogard's playing in the outfield because that's getting his bat in the lineup. Like, yeah, he, he so. just started doing that this week. I yeah. think so. Yeah, it, we'll we'll see what happens there. But yeah, uh, that lineup doesn't have a whole lot to write home about at this point. Um, well, let's move down to guys who may be in Portland by the end of the year. I guess we're checking levels, but I guess we're we're already halfway through the system. So let's just move down to Greenville. Cause we talked about Worcester. We talked about Portland moving down to Greenville. A couple guys I wanted to highlight Ian. I, I mean, there's a bunch of guys worth highlighting that offense has been tremendous. Um, you know, when you look at it, uh, guys up and down the lineup hitting Sidon Raffaella, who was kind of the talk of the system. And, uh, I forget if he was our player of the month for April. I think he was the Red Sox hitter of the month for April, but I don't think he was our player of the month. Wasn't Fitzgerald. Off. It was Fitzgerald, I think. Yeah, correct. Um, controversial pick. Controversial strikeouts. Pick. Well, it was Fitzgerald or it was... Um, it wasn't even... Uh, Rafael may not have even been in the top four by the time the month ended. But at any rate, Rafael is down to a 879 OPS. Um, he still has very good numbers, but 
he's kind of cooled off a bit. Uh, their best hitter right now is probably Alex Benellis, who has walked 24 times in 25 games. Uh, he's rocking a 421 on base percentage at the moment. He's hitting for power too. He's got seven home runs. Uh, good start from him. He's also got five steals and five attempts. And I guess he said on the Rob Bradford podcast the other day, by the way, Ian, I don't know if you saw that. I put this in the Slack. Apparently everyone on the team has the green light all the time. You just need I mean, to be smart about it. I'm fine with that. Yeah. yeah. As long as, he, it, as he's long like, as it, it, it develops good habits and good base running instincts. Cause it's basically saying like, you know, go on you, until you're told otherwise you can go. But if you're, mm-hmm. you know, at it, then we're going to take away your, you know, abilities to run. So, yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, but the guy I want to talk about for a minute, Ian, is the next highest guy in OPS on the team with a 952 OPS, which is good, right? Is Nick Northcutt. So you've heard of a three true outcomes hitter, which means the guy typically strikes out, walks, or hits a home run. Northcutt this year is a two true outcomes hitter. On the season, he has 106 plate appearances. He has 13 home runs, which is by far the most in the system in 25 games. That's kind of bonkers. He's he's on one in terms of hitting. He's he's only four home runs behind his career high. Right, right. He hit 17 last year. Yeah. I mean, I can still remember in spring training overhearing someone saying he was going to hit 30 this year, and he might hit 30 by the damn break at this rate. He's also struck out 40 times in 106 plate appearances for a robust 37.7% K rate. And he has walked all of four times this year. He's been hit by two pitches. I've never seen anything like this. He's got 25 hits, 13 of them are home runs, two are doubles, and 10 of them are singles. He's got more home runs than singles. I mean, and especially lately, it's trended even more in that direction. I'll, I'll, I'll pull up the splits in a minute, but... I just don't know what to make of this. <laughs> I don't know if you do. But. I mean, he's got big raw power. It's below average approach, you know, below average contact skills. You know, I, I think that it's, he's just going to, he's going to hit a, t- this is what he is. He's going to hit a lot of home runs and, you know, he, he, he'll probably do it on a few other teams, but it's, it's tough with that, that big of a K rate to expect success against more advanced pitching. Yeah. 37 is just, it's too high and it, it's higher if you look recently. So, He has hit, let's just look in the last, um, not including today's game, obviously, but the first game of this week at Asheville and then the prior two series. Okay, so we're going back to April the 26th. That uh, comprises 12 games for him. He has nine home runs in those 12 games. Yeah, he's second, he's second in all of minor league baseball in home runs. Um, yeah. The only person ahead of him is Moises Gomez with the Cardinals double-A team. And uh, after I guess him he's is, probably 27. He's 23, something. actually. Oh, really? That's okay. um, And after him is Nolan Gorman, who is not, who's 22 and on the Cardinals AAA team. AAA team. So AAA. he's the only guy in A ball with more than, more with double digits, I should say. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So since April 26th, he's got nine bombs, three singles, and 24 strikeouts and 47 plate appearances. So again, that's a higher than 50% K rate that he is clocking in at right now. It's a 51% strikeout rate. How I mean, he's walked once. I don't understand how that's sustainable. He's got a 261 average and an 848 slugging in that time. I mean, he's hitting for all kinds of power, but I just, it's funny. Like we do the player of the week nominations and I look like, Oh, this guy had four bombs this week. seems a pretty easy pick. And then you realize like, Oh, those were his only hits. Practically. He, he had like two more hits. So yeah, he's a weird hitter right now. Um, fun to follow, but just really, really weird. Um, and the other guy I wanted to mention real quick, Ian, uh, who, who's worth a note is on the pitching side and Shane Drohan on an, on a pitching staff that doesn't really have a lot going on. Um, Drohan was our pitcher of the week, uh, after his start on April the 21st, he went six innings and struck out eight, one walk. Good outing, one unearned run. Got bombed in his next start. Gave up eight runs on 10 hits over five innings. And then he had two outings against Rome last week and was tremendous. In 11 innings, he only gave up six hits, struck out 13, only two walks. Uh, 162 average against. He's looked pretty, or he's, I I don't know how he's looked. I shouldn't say that. But the numbers have been on and off pretty good. He's got, you know, three great starts. Uh, and three not so great starts on the year. So 
for a guy who's 23 in high A, uh, you know, on the left hand side, that's nice, but just uh, intriguing results so far. I, I look forward to getting reports uh, on on Drohan and how he's looked down there. Uh, anyone else in Greenville, Ian, that you wanted to call it? I know we we talked pre show about a few other guys. Um, yeah, I, I think that. Uh, sorry, I switched off the page. Matthew Lugo has has been had a up and down May. Um, he's hit three home runs, which off is encouraging. If you watch him, it, it it's just the same thing I kind of talked about after I saw him in Salem last year. It's when he doesn't try to hit a home run, he's you know at his best, and mm-hmm. that's the one thing is you know when the swing gets long, he hits a lot of balls in the air, kind of like what I was talking about with Hamilton, and it's just a lot of weak contact. And when he's short direct to the ball, you know he he hits a lot of hard line drives, and he's strong enough where the, that ball can carry over the fence too. And so I, I think that's just that's the thing that I'm be watching with him. Um, I'm, it, it, you know, his strikeout rates for about thirty percent this month, which is mm-hmm. a little too high for oh, my high. liking. But oh, um, you know, he's like two sixty seven, three seventy eight, five sixty seven this month. So the power's still there. And um, I think the other one we just mentioned, Nick York. York's you know two fifty, three oh eight, five twenty eight this month. He's got three home runs already. So the power's starting to come. And, I'm not worried about him. I, I think, you know, he's so starter last year would be surprised. The same thing this year, you know, he's going to end up hitting. Um, it's just, you know, just got to be patient with him. Yeah. York, we should mention he missed three games with an illness that was, you know, we didn't, I, I didn't hear whether it was or was not COVID who knows he was sick for three games. He came back and was brutal for another like four. And since he's kind of picked it up a little bit in the month of May, uh, his, his two home runs have come since May 1st. So that's good. Uh, hitting for more power, but also hitting for less contact during that time. So he just needs to kind of put it together. I, I'm still confident he will. I'm not worried about him, but it, 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 the numbers bear watching um, and seeing if those come up. Um, moving on down to Salem, Ian, uh, the one guy you wanted to point out was uh, Eduardo Lopez. Yeah, I think that he's someone we definitely need to be keeping an eye on. Um, this month in May, he is hitting um, – oh, wait, that doesn't include tonight, so I'll try to find – this does include tonight. Uh, including tonight, he's hitting 424, 487, 848 slug. Do you know what he hit in April? No, I, I don't. Why don't you tell us? Uh, well, in April, let's let's be clear. That's in six games because he didn't make, didn't get called up yes. to Salem for in being his, injured until in, the In his first six games, he was two for 24 with 15 strikeouts. Not, <laughs> good. not good. In his last eight games, uh, so 34 plate appearances, larger sample, he's 13 for 28 with, excuse me, that's, it, that doesn't include, this one doesn't include tonight. He's 13 for 28 with five walks and five strikeouts. So, or four, I guess, including tonight, 14 for 33 because he homered again tonight. With six six strikeouts and five walks, so strikeout rate you know under twenty percent, um, walk rate about the same as a strikeout, and he's showing a ton of power. And he's a very interesting person uh, prospect. I mean, I think that he's someone that gets forgotten mm-hmm. because he got hurt and missed so much time. But you know, coming Barely out of extended, played last year, he, yeah, he got a handful of games last coming year. Coming out of extended, he was you know identified by scouts as one of if not the top hitting prospect there is like him and a few other people were mentioned he got up to greenville you know they are excuse me greenville he got up to salem they thought highly enough of him to promote him into salem and he got off to a rough start there and then he got hurt and missed the rest of the season and you know he was still limited in spring training we didn't get a look at him other than the last day he took bp once looked pretty good and now you know he got off to a slow start again this year but he's really found his swing and you know, just the early feedback I'm getting is very encouraging on him. And he's someone I'm definitely going to be monitoring closely Um, because, you know, obviously mayor is the top guy there, but him and Edison Paulini, who also got off to a slow start and uh, and even blaze Jordan too, are now all really hitting the ball. Well. And so um, that's definitely encouraging, you know, Paulino's three sixty eight, four twenty nine, six Oh five this month with three strikeouts and 38 plate appearances. Take that. Take that. And even Jordan, you know, Jordan's 382, 436, 588 with five strikeouts and 34 plate appearances. Hit another home run tonight. So definitely encouraging stuff going on with him also. So, um, yeah, it's good to see, you know, those bats are starting to come around. Um, I mean, even like Eduardo Vaughn, another one, you know, had a really rough first month, 364, mm-hmm. 417, 409 this month. 
So um, yeah, it, it's definitely encouraging seeing what's going on down in Salem with those bats. They seem to have really woken up after a quiet, you know, uh, April. Yep. Uh, one guy that I'll highlight on the pitching side, we'll go with another reliever. Jacob W is Jacob Webb. And he's also in the one bad game club. Um, I'm trying to pull his numbers up right now, but he has numbers that are eerily close to those of Jacob Wallace up in double A. If you take out the one start where he got, you know, lit up for three runs and and two thirds of an inning uh, on the year, I guess it's, it's, I can't add them together quickly, but um, the strikeouts on the year, he's got 24 of them in uh, 12 and two thirds innings only uh, he's got eight walks. So that's too many obviously, but two of them were in that outing where he got bombed uh, three of the nine hits he's given up this year. were in that one outing. So he has been excellent. Uh, maybe need him to cut the walks a little bit, but he's been very good in Salem out of the bullpen as we kind of called coming out of camp. So, and I guess let's, let's hold off on the starting pitching we're, we want to save those guys for next episode. We're going to talk about the starting pitching in Salem a little bit uh, and we'll, you know, so we'll, we'll get on those next time. So let's close out this episode with your emails. Again, podcast at SoxProspects.com. We want to talk about what you want to hear about. So hit us up. Oh, and I guess before that, one last thing while we're doing levels. Um, the Florida Complex League is apparently going to start on June the 6th this year, which is only in about a month, less than a month, and much earlier than it used to be, which I think makes sense because it's not like we're waiting for the draft anymore because the draft is in mid-July. So if you're going to wait until late June, you might as well start in early June. You've got all the guys there already anyway. Every team has enough guys to fill a roster, which I guess is the other part of it. Um, Because before when you had two short season teams, you didn't have enough guys until the draft started. So um, the Red Sox have plenty of guys down there, as we were talking about in the Slack today. They almost have enough, at least offensively, they have enough guys to almost fill two lineups right now. So it'll be good to get those going. So we will see those guys soon uh if you're in fort myers apparently also you can go down and check out extended spring training i know uh bianca smith one of the coaches down there has been like tweeting the schedule <laughs> saying come watch us play we like it so if you're down in fort myers the fort myers area go check out the the red Sox yeah i mean the players also have been tweeting some highlights from down there and some yeah. really impressive stuff going on like nice miguel, nice play by brandon vila i don't know if you caught that i did not day. i was i've been just watching miguel blaze swing on the loop that's yeah, kind that's of true. my jam. And Brian Mata also posted video of him throwing all his pitches. I don't Very know true. if you saw that. Yes, I did see that. So he looks uh, kind of yoked. Yeah, he does. So <laughs> I'm I'm wondering if he might get into some games once the FCL gets going. Agreed. Yeah, we'll be looking forward to that. All right, moving on to emails again. Podcast at socksprospects.com is the email we want to talk about what you want to hear about. And our first email comes from Jake. He says, Hey Chris and Ian, I had a question regarding Jaron Duran. Clearly, he's shown some improvements offensively so far this season in AAA. And as I write this, he just did a two-run double in this afternoon's game against Toledo. He also appears to be striking out at a lower clip. Good things all around. There's been a lot of clamoring to calm up given how poorly Jackie Bradley has done to start the season on offense, although his defense has been superb as always. What are the early returns and how Duran has looked defensively to date? Well, I think the Red Sox could definitely use Duran's bat if he can continue to hit at his current clip. I've always felt like his outfield defense has been at best a work in progress and at worst an outright liability. What's his long-term outlook there? And do you think he could hack it at left field in left field of Fenway? And perhaps more importantly, as a result, could Verdugo hack it in right field so Durant can get in the lineup? Uh, talked about this a little bit, Ian, but I guess really quick on the defensive questions uh, regarding how Durant has looked and that alignment. Yeah, it, it's definitely still a work in progress. Um, he's not the most distinctual player out there. He can make up for it somewhat with his speed, but his roots and you know, first his first uh, his initial read and first uh, first step are pretty inefficient right now, and the arms obviously below average. So yeah, I, I think that it might actually just be a left field profile, and I understand you know that would be kind of wasted of Fenway with his speed not covering a lot of ground. But if you can learn to play the monster, I feel like you can kind of fake it. We've seen guys who are below average defenders make it at Fenway in left field. So it's just going to come down to me. If the if he shows enough bat, they'll find a way to get him in the lineup. That's what's really going to come down with him, I think. Agreed. Our next email comes from our Patreon supporter, Nicholas Staropoli, and he says, hey, Chris and Ian, first time, long time. I'm curious when slash if Brandon Walter will start to get some national attention and recognition. Brian Bayo made Keith Law's preseason top 100, and now Baseball America has him ranked in their top 100. Is there a reason or concern we should be aware of that limits Walter's potential or ceiling? Or does he just need to prove it a bit more after breaking out in the middle of last year? Thanks for all you do. Uh, and I think it's that and the fact that he's old for the level are the two things that he needs to overcome. Yeah, I mean, he is old for the level, but the stuff on its own is very impressive. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, his both his secondaries have been flashing like above average plus, you know, fat, and he's got 
you know, a potential 60, 70 command. So when you combine that stuff, especially with his fastball, with his delivery being pretty funky, but he's a good job of repeating it. And with his fastball, you know, being able to miss bats and get a lot of weak contact, even at, you know, 90 to 93 miles an hour, he's, uh, he's very interesting and really pushing his way to the top, you know, five potentially of the system. Yeah. And the thing with the thing with guys being in the top 100 is there, there can only be 100 top 100 prospects, right? Like, you can't just push your way in necessarily. No, like and other he, guys he, have to I, fall out. I feel like he has the profile of guys who's going to of a player who's going to get overlooked for those national lists just because it's it's I think not. He's starting to get the love though. I could I could see it happening. It's just not going to happen quite yet. Yeah, yeah. I think he, I think he, if he dominated for another month like he did in April, then maybe. But we'll we'll, we'll see. Um, our next question comes from Greg, and he says hello to que- or Gregory. Uh, he says for two questions first. I know he isn't a prospect anymore, but how does Garrett Whitlock look to you? The command and control look very good, and the slider looks like it's taken a step forward. What grades would you put on his pitch mix, et cetera? What overall grade would you put on him now? And I guess we'll stop there for a minute, Ian. I mean, Whitlock looks like, I mean, I don't know if I've seen enough of him as a starter to grade him as a starter yet, but it's got to be a 55, right, overall on uh, uh, Whitlock? Oh, he could be like a 60. He could I know he like, could be, but I'm saying, what would you put on him right now? I would feel comfortable on a 55. And right now he's probably a, a, yeah, he's like a three, four, but I mean, there's definitely, there's potential for him to be like a three slash, like, I think like a low end too, like that kind of range. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then as far as his pitch mix, I mean, I don't, I don't Fastball, know. Fastball sinker, slider, change up. I mean, right. So he's throwing pitch mix. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I, yeah. it's hard. Uh-huh. I have not seen it. I've, I mean, I've watched this year, but I don't grading off TV is tough. Um, it's more, you know, I, something I'd want to see in person to give you an accurate, you know, grade breakdown. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can go to his player page and see what we thought of, of him last year. And that's, mm-hmm. that was where Agreed. we stood. Then. Agreed. And the second question I've heard you've mentioned, I've heard you mention in passing, but how do organizations do advanced metrics, things like exit velocity and spin rate in the minors? Does MLB have special cameras set up in all the ballparks? How far down in the minors do they go? Or does each organization pay for their own equipment? Do they have to share it? Is any of it public like baseball savant? Seems like a technological step for scouting that can give teams an edge. Thank you. Uh, on that piece, every ballpark's got track, man. Yeah. Um, they, they all it's have the it. The teams, teams share uh, it. No. I mean, yeah. Yeah. They do share it. They um, share it it's yeah. an opt-in program. I guess right. you can opt out, but yeah. But they all opt in, at least the yeah. ones that we're aware of all yeah. opt in. Um, it's it's kind of like tape sharing in college sports. Like, in college sports, teams like tape trade with yeah. the future opponents, and it's just kind of accepted that you all do it because it's, it's just n- necessary to get tape on your ne- next opponent. Like there are certain things like that the Red Sox have at their affiliates that they're not going to share with other teams, like especially camera wise. Um, sure, with some sure. of the technology they're using, the you know like those high speed cameras and things like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like the Red and Sox have that set up at the at the complex. Yeah, and that's what I was about to say. Is it goes all the way down to the complex, even spring training. Some of the fields down there are outfitted with TrackMan and things like that. Um, but if you look public, I don't think it's ever going to become publicly available. No. If you look right now, they have it uh, for two leagues, the PCL and the, I think the Florida state league, Florida. Yeah. I guess that's back to what it's have, called. um, have like their track man data is public, but it's, um, it's quote unquote public in that, like it's on a website that if you tweak the URL or did they actually make it public? No, I think it's on, I think it's on the stack ass page. It's actually on stack. Yeah, Cause like I know you, last year, Kylie McDaniel or, or someone talking. Yeah. Kylie you could McDaniel, like back, back, like back door your way into it. You just had um, to tweak the URL to go to the right ballpark or something. I think if you go to, I'm trying to do it right now, but if you go to stack ass, like M I L B there's, um, you can like look at the games. Got I it. think, I believe, let me see. I don't know. I, I've done it before. I can't remember okay. how to do it right now. All right. So but maybe yeah, it's, I'm, I'm, it's, it's available. It's but, available, but it's just said, for those leagues. I'm with, yeah. But I'm also with you. They're probably not going to make it publicly available. I don't think, the, I don't think the teams want it to be do. publicly available. They don't. They definitely don't. But um, yeah. That's all it. right. But good question. And then our next question from Tyler. It's nice and easy. Ian, it says, Ian and Chris, of the five tools, what is your order uh, from most to least important? For and I would... Pit- Pitch. I mean, for a hitter, I guess. Yeah. For a hitter, I guess. And I, the, the, I think I need to caveat this with it kind of depends what position you're talking. Um, I, yeah. I mean, I, the hit has to be one. Hit is always going to be one. But I think after that, it depends what position yeah. you're talking. Yeah. Because if you're talking like a catcher, it would be defense second. 
shortstop center, maybe even. Yeah, if you're if you're talking up the middle, defense is going to be up there. Um, and similarly, like arm doesn't really matter at second base, but you can't play third or base first. or short, right? Yeah. But you can't play third base or shortstop without a good arm. So, it, it, yeah, it's definitely very position dependent. Hit is number one though. Like if you're yeah. a twenty hitter, unless you're an eighty glove, eighty arm shortstop you're not playing in the big leagues. So I'd say if you're a 20 hitter, you're still not. Yeah, we've seen, I think you'd at least got to get to a 30 or 40, maybe Maybe not a 40, but I mean, we've, we've we've seen, we've seen guy, we've seen that profile player get a cup of coffee. Well, right. That's what I'm saying. You're not, yeah, uh, you're not sticking around, but yeah, hit has to be number one because if, I mean, if you're an 80 hitter, they, they'll find a spot for you. You could be an 80, like, Although it's almost like a Nick Madrigal type profile, you've got to have something else. Like he's at least yeah, got some. Yeah, you run. have to have some, you have to have some speed or a little bit of pop. But yeah, like the hit tool is definitely number one. Yep. And then our last email is from Art. He says, uh, "Hey guys, I have a question regarding prospects and defense. I certainly understand how a player may not have the requisite speed to play a position or the arm strength for right field. Those types of limitations could certainly limit the ceiling of a player." However, I was thinking about Jaron Duran. My understanding is that while he lacks arm strength, he has the speed and athleticism to be a quality outfielder. My question is regarding whether prospects frequently develop the skills that are not as based on physical limitations. It would seem that Durant should be able to learn to take better routes, but that does not, but does that actually happen with any frequency? It happens, but like, yeah, it happens. It's not players I don't think should it's be able to learn skills is kind of like, why isn't everyone a 300 hitter? Like you can't well, just yeah, say, well, just, why can't he learn to play defense? It's better? the same thing with like, why can't you, you know, like, why can't I learn to, be a good golfer. Like I can try really hard at practice, but at the end of the day, there's always going to be limitations there. Um, and I, I think with Duran, you know, it, it's it with, with taking like that first read, that's not something you can really teach. Like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, you, you can't be like, watch the fly ball and, or watch the ball off the bat and go this way, depending on like, there's no like cut and dry thing. You know, it, it's obviously it's a case by case thing that it's hard to replicate consistently. You can't like, you know, hit the same fly ball over and over again. Right. And so I, I think that that's one of the hardest, like when we're talking about outfielders, especially, I, I think that you kind of know early whether they have it or don't have it defensively. Like Stan Raphael is a great example. He, and this he is why immediately it, was a great defender. He, we yeah. knew he was going to be like, he, this is why they played him in big league games is what is he 19 or 20 this year? Yeah. Like they were comfortable doing it because they know that, that, that tool translates. They know what he is and they've known for years. Like he just gets it in the outfield. Whereas there are certain Durant's an example of someone, you know, who obviously didn't play there, you know, until he pro ball, but he just hasn't, you know, it hasn't clicked for him with, with regards to his reads and kind of that, you know, those instincts out there. And that's something that I I think is difficult to to teach Um, because if it was, if it was easy to teach, then there, every person would be like a good defender, you know, there'd be no bad defenders. There's a, yeah, exactly. There's a reason bad defenders exist is that it's not just easy to just learn to do better. You know, you don't build the Derek Zoolander school for kids who want to play defense good and do other things good too. So yeah, exactly. I mean, a, a fair question, but yeah, I mean, that that's exactly it. So, all right, again, thank you all for your emails. And I think we're going to wrap it up. So thank you all for listening. Uh, thank you all for supporting the show. Thank you all for downloading. Make sure you follow us on Twitter. Ian is at Ian Cundall. That's I-A-N-C-U-N-D-A-L-L. And follow me at SP Chris Hatfield. Follow the site on Instagram and Twitter at Sox Prospects. Uh, thank you for rating and reviewing the show. And thank you for supporting us on Patreon.com. For our $5 level supporters, especially who are Kyle C., Tyler Woodrow, Jeff Trainer, David Nardone, Tim Harding, Bill Stanton, Deb Kendall, Levin Kirkwood, Hurricanes 1, Chris Fox, James O'Hara, Nathan Kenyon, Andrew Wallen, David B., Ben Burnett, Al Mendelkem, Catrides, Ben and R.I., Paul Daniel, Lundell Martin, James B. McMahon, Stephen Gregory, James Bailey, Andreas Goldstrand, Corey Perrick, Forrest Perkins, Mark Herman, Aaron Meta, Jeff Harwood, Jimmy Mountain, Brian Cowan, Dusty G., Pavel, Jordan Shabbat, Jeffrey Scruggs, Nicholas Staropoli, Bob Introne, Mike Kawano, Chris Bollier, Curtis Waltman, Michael Stewart, Keith Fox, Caleb Farron, John Kane, Andrew K., Tim Ware, Michael Murphy, Kyle Sanborn, Jason Stoneburner, Jack Monahan, and Sam D. Thank you all for your support. Thank you all for listening. We'll be back in your eardrums next week with another episode of the show. Until then, uh, stay safe. Enjoy your week. We're back soon.